I'm Rebecca Heisinger. And I'm Grayson Bixler. Our project is Minty Fresh Before Your Test. Uh, so the question is, can peppermint increase reaction time? Our hypothesis is that peppermint will help reaction time by increasing concentration and reflexes. The importance of this project is that peppermints are often given out before state testing to cal calm nerves and help focus. Research was done to find out more about peppermints and found that the scent of peppermint stimulates the hippocampus and triggers the body to wake up and concentrate. This topic was very intriguing because if the results prove that peppermint can decrease reaction time in a person, perhaps it can help students think more clearly and sharply. The purpose of this project is to test the effect of peppermint on reaction time in a person. Uh, the materials used in this project were peppermints, a human benchmark reaction time test, which is what this is, and the methods used in this project is the number one, the reaction time is tested on the subjects before they are given a peppermint, and then the test subjects are given one peppermint, and then after three minutes the reaction time is tested again. Once the reaction times are compared, the data is recorded. In our discussion, we talked about how the experiment, the goal was to test if we could affect, if peppermint could affect reaction time. <laughs> the result of this experiment showed us that peppermint can affect reaction time and it, can, and it can affect concentration and alertness and make you more awake and more there at the time. Um, it can also improve memory due to the menthol found in peppermint and other studies have also showed that it can stimulate the hippocampus which is the part of the brain that promotes learning and in our conclusion we talked about how the results indicated that the peppermint could affect reaction time and how um, if we had to do it differently we'd pick like different types of peppermint and use a different type of reaction test. And then our acknowledgments, we'd like to thank Morgan Bottom and Tristan Knoll for being our test subjects. And we'd like to thank Mr. Wellman for grading our paper. And lastly, our mothers for buying us supplies. Uh, the results showed that peppermint did affect the reaction time. So before they took the peppermint, the reaction time was about the same. And after, there was a very slight decrease in the reaction time. So the control of our project was the time, or like the test, and the variables was peppermint. <laughs> My name is Rachel Heisinger. My name is Jesse Woodward. And for our project, we did creamy chemistry where we tested the freezing point of liquid to make ice cream. For our hypothesis, we put different things in water to see which one froze better. Our control was the test tube that salt or sugar was not added to, and our variables were the test tubes that salt and sugar were added to. For our conclusion, we figured out that test tube number four and five work better with sugar than salt for freezing. And we ran into no problems. If we did do our project differently, we would get a more accurate container to place the test tubes in to make sure that the temperature is correctly monitored throughout the project. Our project has many practical applications as to making sweet ice cream for freezing. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lila Johnson. I'm a freshman at Hitchcock Tulare High School. My project is called Pump It Up. For my project, I tested if the PSI has any effect on how high a volleyball will bounce. My hypothesis was that the higher inflated balls bounced higher. For my project, I inflated a one ball to 4.2 PSI, 4.3, 4.4, 4.5, 4.6. And 4 I uh, set up a tape measure flush to the floor in the top of the balcony, which is 8, 1, and 7 8 inches tall. And then I uh, set up a camera in slow motion behind it. I dropped the ball three times from the corresponding measurement, um, averaged out the answer, and recorded my results in the table. My results supported my hypothesis in which the higher inflated balls bounced higher. <clears throat> if I were to do this project differently, I could use different types of volleyballs. This project used the Wilson Beach Volleyball Pro. 
if I were to do it again, I could also do um, the temperature. So do it in the warm weather versus cold weather. I also could create difference in PSI bigger to make it like 4 point, 4.5 and 6 to create a bigger um, results. Um, if I were to continue with this project, I probably would do the create a bigger difference in the PSI because this one, as you can see, the results were only about an inch apart. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Cambry Huckman. And I'm Reagan Luter. And this year we did DNA fingerprinting of three horses. And our project is basically observing uh, or having an observational study of three different horses, related or not related, you'll find out later, and seeing if we can find any markings or similarities between the three. Um, for basically our hypothesis, we um, kind of both agreed that we thought there was going to be some similarities to each of the three horses, but maybe not many. And we used ourselves to observe the horses and our um, phones and cameras to take pictures of them to compare the bodies of the horses and markings and colors to find the similarities. Um, we basically found out for um, that they do have some similar markings. They're not the same, but similar. They also, um, we thought it was kind of cool, but they don't have any family relations to each other. So it was kind of interesting to see that they did have some observational similarities. And for any problems that we may have ran into would be um, weather complications between snow and having to be able to get out to the barn and take their pictures and observe them. The horses didn't really like to be, it's really hard to take pictures of them without a, like a halter or anything. So we were definitely had to become creative with that. Um, if we did our project differently, we'd probably use different like subjects or different animals. And maybe have a wider variety to figure out any different similarities between animals that aren't even related at all. Since this year we didn't really get to test the DNA of our um, horses or test subjects, we are going to continue this next year and test the DNA instead of just observing. But this year we wanted to uh, learn more about our uh, like project and what it was all about and get more information and knowledge of what we were doing. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cambry McNeil. And I'm Eric Salmon. And this is our project, Essentially Clean. So our project was comparing household disinfectants to essential oils as disinfectants. And our hypothesis was that uh, essential oils can clean just as well as other household disinfectants. Our control for this experiment was our dirty control plate. And our variables are the different disinfectants that we have. We used the essential oils doTERRA On Guard and Young Living Thieves. And the household items we used were bleach, Lysol, and vinegar. So after our experiment, we concluded that essential oils are just as effective in cleaning bacteria as household products. Our final ranking from most effective to least effective was the doTERRA on guard, then bleach, and then in third was Young Living Thieves, and then it was Lysol, and our least effective tested was vinegar. <laughs> and if we were to come up with another conclusion, we would use um, other kinds of disinfectants, and we could use a broader range of essential oils. We luckily did not run into any problems in this project, but if we were to do it again, we would test more essential oils and we could also test diluted oils versus pure oils. And our project does have many different uh, practical applications because we could use essential oils to clean just throughout our house to promote a healthier and cleaner way of life. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carter Miller. And I'm Kylie Martin. And our project is tan or ban. Our project was seeing how different tanners, self-tanners, worked on different skin tones and types. Our hypothesis was that the darkest tan would last the longest, and our darkest tan was tanned AF. Our control during this experiment was that each subject would have their natural skin color exposed 
along with the self-tanner strips. Our variables were our three tans, Jurgen's Natural Glow, Tanned AF, and Subline Bronze from L'Oreal. Our conclusion of our experiment was that we were correct in our hypothesis and Tanned AF was in fact the longest and the darkest lasting tanner. Um, we could have come up with another conclusion if we had reapplied the tanners and went for a longer period of time, but we only went for the two week period. We unfortunately, or fortunately did not run into any difficult problems during our experiment and it went as we had planned it. Um, if we did our project again, we would add more skin types and skin tones to our project and actually more tanners. And if we were to continue in this project, we would just do like what Kylie said earlier and add a second layer of tanner to the skin where it was already applied to see how that tanner would work with a reapplication. Um, our project does actually have practical applications to the real world because um, many young women struggle with self-confidence and they apply um, self-tanner to make themselves feel better about themselves and they don't want to look patchy and get made fun of because that's even worse for their self-confidence and we want to find we wanted to find a good tanner for them to use at a good price thank you thank you this is braxton jacobs i'm tucker buhals for our project we did bridge designs determine weight bearing ability our hypothesis is that we think the truss bridge will be the strongest because of the triangle shapes Triangle shapes, really strong, and a bunch of them together is even stronger. The materials we used was around 500 popsicle sticks, one foot of string, one five-gallon bucket, two high glue guns, some sand, and a scale. The methods we used for each bridge was we built two models of each, three bridges, so six in total, and then we tied a string hanging, a string onto the bucket hanging, then we slowly filled it with sand. Then after the bridge collapsed, we filled, we weighed the sand, and then we got to weigh it. And Tucker's gonna say the results. Uh, come in last place was the beam bridge. Coming in second place was the truss bridge, and then coming in first was the arch bridge. With an average of 35 pounds, the arch bridge came in first. With an average of 30.5 pounds came the truss bridge, and in last place with an average of 24.25 pounds came the beam bridge. Discussion. One of the problems that affected our results was the materials could have been bad and not right, actually. And then we also could have had a problem where we put too much glue. For conclusion, in summary, the arch bridge displayed the highest weight ability and with a supporting capacity of 20, 35 pounds. Falling 4.5 pounds behind the arch bridge is the truss bridge with a weight capacity of 30.5 pounds. In the last place is the beam bridge with a weight capacity of 24.25 pounds. Acknowledgements. We would like to thank my dad, Casey, and my mom, Tanya, for supplying the materials and then thank Kaylee Brock for letting us use the lab. Hello, my name is Caitlin Schrader. And my name is Isabel Gilbert. And the title of our project is Lighting Up Luminal. So um, for our project, we wanted to compare the brightness that was given off by luminol reactions um, by different sources of copper when the copper comes into contact with the luminol. And we also tested if the level of oxidization on the pennies affected the oxidization process and the brightness. So um, our hypothesis going into our project was that the um, most concentrated source of copper that we had, which was copper sulfate, we believed that that was going to provide the brightest and the longest reaction. And as for the pennies, we believed that the 1990 penny, which had the highest level of oxidization on its surface, would provide the brightest and longest glow as well. Our control in our project was, one, the amount of luminol that we used for each of the reactions, and two, the amount of water that we added into our mixture. So um, the variables in our uh, project involved um, the 
Give me a second. The source of copper that we used, as well as the level of oxidization that was on the surface of each of the three pennies. Um, the results of our project, which uh, blend into our conclusion, are that, based off of our hypothesis, which supports our results, the 1990 penny did offer the brightest reaction, but we also found that the 1994 penny had one of the longest reactions, therefore it stayed brightest for the longest amount of time. So um, as for any problems that we ran into, um, the main problem that we found that we came, that came to us was um, we had difficulty with capturing our results. The room that we were in wasn't the darkest, so we, we had trouble with um, capturing accurate results to be able to display here, but we can definitely fix that in the future. To add on to our conclusion, we concluded that the pennies with the most oxidization on them did provide the brightest reaction. And then if we were to do our project differently or continue our project, we would add more variables to our project and again, get more accurate photos so that we can provide better results. So as for practical applications in the real, war, real world for our project, we believe that the results that we came up with um, would be beneficial to people who work with luminol on a regular basis, such as forensic scientists or chemists. And we believe that just knowing this kind of stuff can be very helpful in their work environment. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dalton Ratchin, and my project is on how bentonite can decontaminate water. Um, my hypothesis was that bentonite acts as a decontaminator of water. For my materials, I used a plastic water bottle filled with two grams of dirt, I used a pH test level kit, um, two grams of bentonite powder, and 100 milliliters of distilled water. My first thing I did was I filled the water bottle with two grams of dirt, and, the dis and then I tested the distilled water for the pH. I next then took two grams of bentonite and added it to the contaminated 100 milliliters of water. Um, the 100 milliliter, milliliters of water rested for 24 hours and then after that 24 hour period I then looked at the water again and realized that the water became much clearer. The reason behind that is because the bentonite acts as a seal slash decontaminator and tries to crumb up all the dirt and bring it into a, a solid almost. And so then you have clear and decontaminated water. Um, um, the importance behind this project um, was mainly because of my family. We run a well drilling business and we use bentonite for drilling. We use it for a little bit different application, but um, I still thought I would do this project just because it's bentonite and we use it just a little bit different. But uh, so we use it every day and I thought why not use it so I, uh, I decided to uh, use bentonite for um, a decontaminator of water. I would really like to thank my father, Jeremy for the idea of the project. Um, I would also like to thank Hitchcock Tudor High School for letting all the kids compete in the science fair. Lastly, I would like to thank Ms. Brock for helping me with any questions I have with this project. Um, it was a great time. I really enjoyed it. So uh, that's about all I got. Hello, I'm Preston Whiff. That is Tristan Knoll. He is my science fair partner. And our project is Gatorade versus orange juice. In our experiment, we tested whether Gatorade or orange juice has more electrolytes. In our hypothesis, we thought that Gatorade would have more electrolytes due to the amount that it is advertised. Our control was we took a multimeter and hooked it up to a plastic straw wrapped with copper wire in a plastic container with, that had orange juice and Gatorade in it. The results were that orange juice had more electrolytes than Gatorade. 
in conclusion, you should drink uh, more orange juice. It's healthier. Uh, it's higher in electrolytes if you need to replenish them. So that's what we recommend. Uh, if we were to do the project differently, though, we would definitely add more liquids so we can get more diverse results and show what is the same and different between different liquids. So we would like to thank Mr. Wallman, Ms. Brock, and Mr. Gross for helping us with this project, and Mr. Wenzel for helping us record this video. So that is our project. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Michael Nielsen. I'm Nick Tolleson. This is our project on the corrosion of metal. Our variables for this project was water, battery acid, wind, and outdoor. We also had a control to test the changes. Our hypothesis was that the battery acid would do the most damage to the steel, followed by the water, then the outdoor, then the wind tests. Our conclusions were slightly different than our hypothesis, not because of the battery acid. The battery acid was by far the most damage inducing, but our conclusions were different because the outdoor and the wind test plate had done more damage that we saw than the water test plate. This um, conclusion was used and found by a bend by putting each plate under compression and then cutting them to see visually see the difference. The uh, things we could have done different with our project is using different type of metal, different thickness of metal, longer time of testing to get more corrosion, more variables to test. The main one would just be going longer so you can get more from the tests. The only problems we really had or difficulty in this test was constant application of the certain um, liquids to the test plates, so like the water and battery acid, just making sure that we can have that applied every day was our biggest problem. Everything else was kind of just keeping it in the same environment, except of course for the outdoors. Practical application of our project would be to test the lifespan of farm equipment or other metal things on a farm that are exposed to the elements. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sienna Stoner. Hi, my name is Cindy Stoner. And uh, our <laughs> project is about twin telepathy. The only reason why we're doing this project is because we always get the question asked, do we have twin telepathy? What is twin telepathy? So our question is, is twin telepathy real? Um, our importance of this project is that for other pairs of twins around the world to realize they may have something that no one else could. Our hypothesis is we think we're going to be more mentally telepathic than physically telepathic. Material. Material. Um, ice, paper, biofreeze, pop, sinks, and a faucet. So we conducted five tests, uh, two being physical and three being mental. Um, we used ourselves as test subjects and we're trying to figure out what connections of twin telepathy that we have, if we have any. So for our first trial, um, actually Miss Brock had to come up with our tests and we had two assistants, which were our classmates. And then we, so for our first trial, we had three different colors of squares set out in front of us, just like in this picture. And we were in different rooms, and we had to choose a color. We ended up, I chose yellow, and she chose red. So that test was a fail. Um, for trial two, our classmates laid out three different pops, um, Sprite, Mellow Yellow, and Orange Crush, and we said how to choose which ones we thought, and we both chose Sprite. Uh, for trial three, Cindy had Biofreeze put on her forearm and we had to wait for a minute for it to kind of kick in, settle in, and then I was asked if I felt anything different with my body. So I felt like a tingling. It was like weird. I felt something different with my arm. So we kind of think that that test was 
somewhat, somewhat right. I don't know. <laughs> and then for trial five, Sienna, four, four. trial four, <laughs> Sienna was told to um, put ice on her collarbone. And after a minute, I was asked if I felt any different. And I said, I felt coolness on my right side of my chest, as you can see here. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a picture. So let me videotaped it so we just kind of screenshot it. Yeah and then for the fifth trial I had to put my right hand under warm water and my left hand under cold and we had to wait for like I had to keep them under there for about a minute and Cindy was asked again if she felt anything different her hands were cold right away and then she said that her right hand got really warm like sweaty and clammy. Here we go. So keep going. What? For discussion, we er, <laughs> in discussion. We were surprised throughout the years of our childhood. Uh, like the similar things would happen. We would either like say the same thing at the same time or get the same thing at a store. We just figured it was always a coincidence, though. Um, then we learned about twin telepathy, and we figured we wanted to test it. So we tested it. Um, in our hypothesis, we thought that we were going to be more mentally telepathic. Well, turns out we were more physically telepathic. Uh, we did some research and we saw some stories about twins feeling the same thing that the other one felt, but we just we didn't know if we believed it, just because it's the internet. And then, when uh, after testing it, we were in disbelief. Yeah. And then for our conclusion, twin telepathy does exist in me and Sienna, more mentally than physi or physically, more physically <laughs> than mentally. And even though it's not scientifically proven, it does exist. And Sienna and Sydney would like to try more tests to see like what part of our brains connect. Um, if we were to do this project again, we would. <laughs> um, we would like to try to figure out what parts of our brains are connecting. Um, we did run into one issue when we were when I was putting my hands under the water. I actually put them both under cold water, and I was supposed to put one in warm water, but it turned out being okay because her hands were cold, so it just turned out in the right for us. Yes, and then we would like to thank our fellow classma classmates that helped us with this project, and we would also like to thank Ms. Brock for setting up the test and just getting it all together for us, and then we would also like to thank her for anything that we asked, and she would help us. Mm -hmm. And here are some pictures, some ultrasounds, baby pictures. At that age, you can see like we our differences difference. started to change, and then this yeah. is us now. We look nothing like. And I wore pink and she wore purple. So yes, we have no idea if we're identical or fraternal, but... Bye! <laughs> Good morning, my name's Avery Esty. And I'm Danica Jacobs. And our project is Home Sweet Home. Our project is about what soil will grow wildflowers the best. And the importance of the project is what soil would you, we're trying to help people find the right soil and which type of soil to grow flowers in. Um, our hypothesis was that the potting soil would grow the flowers the best and it was proven wrong. Our materials in this project was potting soil, gravel, farm soil, aka the fertilized soil, and rocky soil. We needed four coffee cans. We needed a source of water. For the experiment, the following steps were the wildflower seeds were acquired. Four kinds of dirt were gathered in coffee cans. Seeds were planted about 5.1 inches below the dirt. And the plants were watered every 48 hours, so about two days. Once the seeds were planted, the data was recorded. The every 14 days and then we the measurements were recorded every week as you see in the graph while we were doing this project we noticed in week one as you can see on the graph the fertilized soil grew the most and the other three did not grow at all in week two the fertilized soil was still ahead 
with the others slowly catching up, but the potting soil is still one of the slowest growing plants. In week three, fertilized is still at the top and potting soil is still the slowest growing. In week four, the fertilized soil pulled ahead a lot with the rocky soil close behind and the gravel is somewhere in between with the wildflowers growing around the rocks and adapting to their environment. With the potting soil, with the potting soil, um, the wildflowers grew a little bit and then they stopped growing. <coughs> and then some errors we had during this experiment is that cats got into the plants and walked all over them and about killed them. And then both of us were gone for a couple days and no one was able to water them. But once we both got back, we got on top of watering and they came back alive. If we ever do this project again, we will make sure that we have someone to water them if any of us are gone. And then we will put the flowers somewhere where animals or humans can't get to them so they have a better chance of surviving. <clears throat> So the hypothesis was proven wrong. And as we used four types of soil, the potting soil, gravel, the farm soil, AKA the fertilized soil, and the rocky soil. So as you see in the graph, she kind of already explained it. Um, we thought that the potting soil was gonna grow the plants the best because normally if you go out and buy potting soil <clears throat> or want to grow flowers, you're gonna wanna buy potting soil. Um, it was shocking that over the like over time we expected the gravel not to grow the flowers at all but as you see in this picture um so there's a bunch of rocks here the <clears throat> the plants started to grow around the pro around the rocks and they started to adapt to their environment which we thought was pretty cool um but it just kept we just kept saying that um seeing that the potting soil it wasn't growing the plants at all um, it super, super, super shocked us that the fertilized soil kept growing um, the plants the best because that's not what we expected at all. And the rocky soil came in second, which was growing the plants pretty good, but <clears throat> the fertilized soil was obviously the best. Um, as time went on, we noticed that the flowers were not growing at first and we were getting a little worried, so we just tried to water them more, we took better care of them, and then um, they started to grow a lot better. So basically, if you wanna do plants, don't go buy it. Don't go buy potting soil, because it was proven that the potting soil is the worst, and you could just go out in your backyard and get some dirt and plant your flowers.
I'm Devin Inander. I'm Patrick Maynard. And today our project is over what substances make ice melt the fastest. For our project, we took six different substances and placed ice in the substance to see which substance can make the ice melt the fastest. Our hypothesis was that the hot water would melt the ice the fastest other than, other, than the other substances. Our control was just the regular room temperature water with an ice cube in it. Any other? Er, our variables were these six substances. It was salt, sugar, baking soda, room temperature water, cold water, and hot water. Our conclusion was that hot water melted the ice the fastest and that cold water melted the ice the slowest. Uh, another conclusion that we could have had was salt came in second of the hot water, so that was the second fastest in melting the ice. We did not run into any problems, but if we would do this project differently, we would use a one-half teaspoon instead of a one-fourth teaspoon to make the mixture stronger to melt the ice. If we kept going on with this project, we would add more than six substances next time and see what else would help melt ice. This project could be used in the real world to melt ice off the sidewalks or to get ice off the roads. Thank you. Hi, I'm Derek Johnson. I'm Aiden Morehouse, and our project is What Attracts Raccoons the Best. So we were wondering, chick or farmers have chickens to produce eggs for their family, but raccoons, pesky little critters, they always get in there. So we wanted to know what you could do to trap them and get rid of the problem. Our hypothesis for this experiment was that tuna was going to attract them the best. What could we control? We could control where the traps were placed and how they were baited. Our variables would be if, a, er, where the tra if there's any raccoons in the area and if the traps were in a good spot. Our conclusion is that the bacon was second, followed by the tuna. Oh, fuck, I messed up. Just keep going. Just keep going. And then the eggs, marshmallows, and apples, as well as corn, followed that. The problems we ran into is my cat and my dog got into our traps. How, if we could do it differently, we would do it again. We would maybe change the traps to be a little smaller so our dog can't get in and bait them a little differently so the cat wouldn't get in. We would proceed to continue the project by maybe expanding to more areas and placing more traps. And trying out different baits. Hi, my name is Madison Watson and my partner is Kayla Fashing and we are freshmen in Hitchcock Tuller High School and our project was about the bacteria growth in loofahs versus washcloths. Our hypothesis was that the loofah would grow more bacteria than the washcloth would and the materials we used was a plastic loofah, a cotton washcloth, a cotton swab, nutrient agar petri dishes, and body wash. We used the loofah for a normal week which in a shower with soap and after each use we allowed it to dry. On the last day of the of the week the loofah was allowed to dry and then we swabbed it. We took the swab, swipe, wiped it on the nutrient agar in the petri dish. We placed the dish in a shoe box and let it sit under the heat lamp for four days. After the four days, we then removed the, the shoe box, the petri dish from the shoe box and taken a photo of it. And we did the same thing for the washcloth. We used it for a week. We allowed it to dry after each use. On the last day, we swiped it with a cotton swab. And then we took the swab, wiped it on nutrient agar, put it in a shoe box and used it for four days. After four days, we took it out and taken a picture of it, and then we observed the difference of bacteria growth. We found an ex this experiment verified through an article, and the article said that loofahs and washcloths both hold a lot of bacteria. And after we did this experiment, we concluded that they actually do both hold a lot of bacteria, and bacteria does flourish in them. And the mistakes we made, we could have done this more 
efficiently and more organized. And if we ha would have done that, we would have clear results. And if we did this experiment longer than three to seven days, it would have been more extreme. And two experiments we could have conducted off of this topic was we could uh, test the loofah and washcloth for bacteria to see if pre-existing bacteria contributed to the bacteria growth. And we could also uh, test the skin of the user for bacteria before showering. We concluded that the, both the loofah and the washcloth grew different types of bacteria. The loofah grew big chunks around the petri dish and the washcloth grew small specks of bacteria evenly around the petri dish. And this experiment was done over 21 days with a normal routine doing the same thing for both the washcloth and the loofah. And we, did, we thought this experiment was important because it would allow people to know which one was more hygienic and was better for their hy hygiene. We would like to thank our science teacher, Ms. Brock, for helping us out getting supplies and answering our questions. We, we would also like to thank our Dean of Students and Agriculture Educator, Mr. Gross, for allowing us to use his greenhouse for this experiment. And we'd also like to give a special thanks to our classmates and parents for supporting us throughout our project. Hello, I am Cooper Cole and my project was Organic Battery. Um, from what I for what I did, I tested what was better, what made more energy, lemons or potatoes. And I believe that the lemons would make more because in my research I found out that acid reacts with the metal zinc. Well, most a some acids react with the metal zinc and that's what we need to stick in the potatoes and lemons. Um, I believe this could help people if they didn't have enough batteries for something in an emergency situation. They just needed like a small light that could prove useful to them. Um, from what I found out after, no, my materials were I used four potatoes, four lemons, four pieces of copper, like copper wire or pennies, and four pieces of zinc that can be galvanized nails. One multimeter and five electrical leads with alligator clips. They're like jumper cables, but smaller. So I hooked, so I put one zinc nail, well, galvanized nail, and one piece of copper on almost separate sides of the potato and lemon. I did that to all the potatoes and all the lemons. Then I connected one alligator clip from the galvanized nail to a piece of copper on a different potato. And then I did that until it was almost a full loop. On the first potato, I had one piece of copper exposed still. So I hooked a clip to that and the other end to the multimeter. And then on my last one, I had a piece of zinc left. So I hooked the algae clip to that, and then I hooked the other side of the clip to the multimeter. And it read out as the potatoes were 3.2 volts, and the lemons were 3.24 volts. So the lemons produced a little bit more than potatoes, because the lemons had more acid than the potatoes, so it reacted more with the zinc. Uh, another way I could do this, or another project for next year if I wanted to continue this, is if I hooked up potatoes and lemons to see if that would work, or I could add another acidy uh, food or vegetable. And I'd like to acknowledge my parents, Todd and Jennifer Cole, for helping me with this, with space, and giving me enough resources to do this. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Brooklyn Frankenstein, and this is my science fair project, 
don't taste the rainbow. So my overall question is, are artificial food dyes bad for you? Well, what would the importance be? So did you know that your favorite candy probably has artificial food dyes in them? Although artificial food dyes are commonly added to food, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're good for you. Artificial food dyes are in foods like Fruit Loops, M&Ms, Skittles, all different types of candy that I personally love and many other people love too. So why is this important? This helps people have a better understanding of what chemicals they are putting in their bodies my hypothesis. So I originally hypothesized that the celery and the flowers would have an effect to them. I did not know that they were going to change colors due to the dye, but a part of my hypothesis, I did think that it would help speed up the dyeing process. Here are my materials. I used white carnation flowers, celery, jars, water, food dye. Um, I think that's about it. And for my methods, I started by cutting off the ends of my celery to have a fresh cut for the veins to um, let the water and nutrients go up to them. Uh, same with my white carnations, I cut off the end of the stem so that they also had a fresh cut. Um, next, I put an even amount of water in each of my jars to make sure they all have the same effect going to happen to them. So I first started with no water in my celery, water, red water and blue water. So the red is actually red 40 and the blue is blue three. So it might not be a good picture from here, but in my diagram, I do have the no water. You can tell that the celery is very flimsy. It could easily be breakable and you, it, the, it's lacking moisture. The moisture is evaporating out of it. And clearly that makes sense because there's no water in it. Now with my water, the celery stalk is perfectly healthy, nice and strong structure, uh, still ready to eat. You could dip some ranch in it if you wanted. Uh, then we have my red, red dye with my celery. And you can very clearly tell that the celery was dyed red. The veins on the inside are red. The leaves are dying, curling up. They just aren't, aren't thriving very well. Now we have my blue water, and you can tell that the blue water definitely dyed the insides of the veins also. Not as bad as the red dye did, but the leaves were significantly blue also. Very crispy to the touch. Um, I was afraid that they were actually going to break off while I was taking a picture of them, but thankfully they did not. So if you look at both of the red and blue up closer a little maybe, um, you can tell that they were actually fully hollowed out. So you'd think that even though they're sitting in water, it, even though it's dyed, um, they're still sitting in water, you'd think that they'd still have some moisture in them, but they actually were completely hollowed out with zero moisture in them. Now we have my white carnation flowers. I started with putting a flower in no water, and clearly it died. It shriveled up, it's all droopy, it's not happy anymore. Um, now we have the one in the water. Its petals are nice and uh, voluminous. They're soft to the touch. It's very pretty. Um, and that's your type of flower that could last weeks on in a vase or a bouquet. Um, now we have the blue water. You can very clearly tell in my picture, um, up close that is, uh, that the petals are very turned blue. They're collapsed. They formed to collapse into a ball and they just aren't sprouting out like the rest of the flowers are. They're very crispy to the touch. Um, yet again, like the celery, I was very scared that the petals on the flowers were gonna fall off, um, but thankfully they did not. I tried not to touch them as much as possible. Now for my red flower, um, you can tell that the red dye did affect the petals also, but not as bad as the blue dye. Um, it makes you consider like why why the blue uh, affected the flower so much over the red, um, whereas the red affected the celery more than the blue did. So that was kind of a question that I was like, what's going on here? Um, but yeah, so overall, that's my results of what happened. And I can conclude that there was something going on with these artificial food dyes. And clearly, you can see that it helps speed up the dyeing process. So knowing that 
these food dyes can do this to celery flowers other living organisms doesn't that make you wonder what you're consuming inside of your body um, this this experiment really overall showed the negative effects that artificial food dyes can have on living organisms and that's the main statement that i wanted to uh, prove throughout my project and finally for my acknowledgments i'd like to start by thanking my mom for providing the celery flowers mason jars, water, food color, all that jazz. Um, next, I'd like to thank my brother for helping me. Uh, he was reading off the instructions, materials of the experiment while I was trying to do it at once. Um, finally, I'd like to thank Miss Brock for helping me throughout the year, trying to guide me which experiment would do better, if the celery or the flowers would do better. Um, she overall helped me kind of uh, pick which path to go on and so I want to thank her for that too um, and that's my project thank you I'm Travis Gordon I'll be finding the fastest way to melt ice my hypothesis is that salt will make ice melt the fastest my importance is to see if any household items would melt ice efficiently so for my materials I will need seven plastic bowls sugar vinegar table salt baking powder coolant hot water, measuring cups, ruler, ice, and stopwatches. I will grab bowls from the cupboard and set them on the table, two tablespoons of solids and four inches of liquids. The solids and liquids are put into the bowls at the same time. After the household items were inserted, the ice was put into the bowls and the stopwatch was started. The bowls were watched carefully and recorded the time once it was completely melted. During the research for this project, my sources said that the cold water would melt ice the fastest than hot water. During these experiments, the hot water was faster than the cold water about 17 minutes. Salt was one of the slowest and the was the surprising twist is since it's used on roads, it would seem like it would be the fastest. The hypothesis was incorrect. The salt did not melt ice the fastest. Hot water and vinegar melted the fastest. Both in a little over six minutes, baking powder took the longest to melt, over 40 minutes. It was surprising because it contains the same amount of salt in it. Attempting this experiment again, the variables would change. It would be the volume of the ice. And the amount of ingredients used, I would cut that down by half. The scale would be updated to see if the amount of ice and the ingredients would be created from a different outcome. Hello there, my name is Walker Alfred, and I, this is, is Yawning Contagious. The question I'll be answering, why do some people yawn after seeing someone else yawn? The reason why, so, so married. It basically, if someone else yawns, you'll yawn too. So what I did was read a poem in the middle of I yawned in the middle with it, and Miss Hudson, who is on the camera, tied up your y yawns. We use writing utensils, paper, and a short story. I thought the upper 40 percent of the crashed yawn, while 30 percent of English crashed yawn. And in, in conclusion, Yawning is contagious. Uh, I originally, I thought the opposite would happen. I thought more people would yawn it out for the equals because of schoolwork, but the opposite happened. I believe it could be because of one thing, the start of the day. And that is it. Hi, my name is Cash Chaplin. My name is Max Gilbert. And today we are talking about seed germination and different depths. You might be wondering what is the de best depth for growing grass seed and why is it important? It's important because it's often planted at the wrong depths and can, it, can affect how the seed grows and germinates. Our hypothesis is that the plant, seed planted at 0.25 inches is going to come up first, but the seed planted at 0.5 inches is going to grow faster because it has deeper and stronger roots. Our materials and methods, methods we, we got our soil to plant the seeds in 
Then we got two seeds at different depths, which were 0.25 and 0.5. And then we water them the same amount every single day. And then we measure how much each of them grow each week. And finally, at the end of 30 days, we will do one last measurement to see how much they've grown. And our materials were seed starter, grass seed, shovel water, a tray to plant the seeds in, a measuring cup to make sure we have an accurate amount of water, and a tape measure to measure how much they've grown. Um, our results after the first week of growing, um, neither of the uh, plants had broken through the soil surface. And after the second week of growing, the seed at 0 0.25 inches had broken through the surface and was growing well but the seed at 0.5 inches had just barely broken through the surface of the soil. And after the third week of growing, the seed planted at 0.5 inches had almost reached the height of the seed planted at 0.25 inches and was growing much faster. And then after the fourth week of growing, the seeds had all grown to about the same height with the seed at 0.5 inches a little bit higher than the seed at 0.25 inches. Um, our conclusion, in conclusion, we found that the best depth to plant the seed at was 0 0.5 inches because it got more water and had deeper and stronger roots. But the seed point planted at 0.25 inches grew qu more quickly. So if you needed the seed to come up fast, then maybe that would be better. Um, our acknowledgments, we'd like to thank Michelle and Aaron Gilbert, Isabel Gilbert, and Miss Brock for helping out on this project. And you might be asking what we would change. We probably plan another set of seeds to make sure it's pretty much the same throughout all seeds. But yeah. Hi, my name is Peyton Chasenock, and my project's about how far is too far. My hypothesis is how. How far can an arrow be shot by a typical compound bow? Um, my variables were a 16, 60 pound compound bow and a 45. Um, my conclusion is the 60 pound bow is the best for a range because it hits more from, from more distance. Um, I ran. I ran into like three pr problems while doing this, um, all due to other. Um, well, if I had to do this project again, I would probably change the way that I did this whole setup. Um, That's all. Hello, this is Raya with What Bean Plant Grows Better in Sunlight or Artificial Light. Um, I try to see what uh, bean plant will go better in artificial or sunlight. Um, my hypothesis was that the sunlight would do better since it's seen in all the natural vitamins of the sun. My control, I didn't have any, so we're going to skip that question there. My variables were the bean plant. Uh, my conclusion was that, so in conclusion, the bean plant, the what bean plant would go better in sunlight or artificial light, and our results that one in the sunlight did better by three inches of growth than the artificial light. Uh, what is my, oh, no, I already did a conclusion. Could you have come over the, no, I would not come up with a conclusion. Do you run any problems? Uh, the plant's not growing, right? How did you get your project differently? Uh, nothing. You do continue with your project. How would you proceed? Nothing. Nothing. Let's have to record. All right. Hi, my name is Riley Knock. And my name is Jocelyn Wagner. Our project is Built That Women. We chose this project because we were both live on cattle farms and wanted to find a way to reduce the amount of woods that occur in our herd. In our project, we took women with some cattle and put corn in it to learn what size of corn particle made cattle bolt the most. Our hypothesis was that the smallest, smallest particle size with the most starch available would make them bolt the most. But before we dive in, here is some information that you will need to know. A bolt is when there is gas or foam buildup in the rumen, which is the largest compartment of the ruminant stomach. 
Room of food or juice is the microbes and bacteria that do their digesting. To do this project, we took room of juice and put corn in it and measured the pH and temperature every minute for five minutes. Then we measured that at 10, 15, and 25 minutes. We did this with the room fluid from cattle that regularly ate corn and those that didn't to see if it would have any effect on the results. We used three different sizes of corn particles, cornstarch, medium particle, and large particle corn. After we put the corn in the room juice, we dumped half of it into an Erlenmeyer flask and put a balloon over the top to see how much gas was produced. We watched the half of the room juice in the beaker to see how much foam was produced. In order to do this project, we used many materials. Some materials that we used besides the room juice and corn were beakers, flasks, stopwatches, um, balloons, and the hot plate. As you can see on these graphs, the temperature and pH changed throughout the experiment, but not in relation to one another. The reason we don't have any foam or gas measurements on here is because none of the beakers produced any foam or gas. Even though the results weren't what we expected, we learned that a blow may take longer to show up. But there are two reasons why we came up with for why the experiment didn't work. The first is that the room and microbes are not naturally exposed to oxygen, so they may have just died from the stress of being exposed to oxygen. Um, and another is that the room and microbes didn't have enough time to react with the corn. Um, although none of the beakers produce foam or gas, like we expected, a blunt may simply just take longer than 25 minutes to occur. We also learned that the pH and the time have it, or temperature had nothing to do with each other. Um, we would like to thank Dr. Roxanne Nock and Eric Nock for helping us um, with the calculations and the information that we needed to do this project. And then we would also like to thank um, our science teacher, Ms. Brock, for supplying most of the materials as well. Thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? No. Oh.